Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, we are going to be really digging into our gospel lesson from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. This is one of the most famous passages of scripture, Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's one that if you've been in church before, you have heard about. But I think it's a passage that sometimes we take a little bit for granted because it's one that is so well known. It's one that we just kind of almost gloss over and don't really think about very much. And we just see the miracle and the, the amazing moment of the miracle that Jesus performs and don't see all the other little things that are in this that I think are actually in some respects more important than the miracle itself. And so today, we're really going to dive into this passage, and so I invite you to open up your Bibles or your pew Bibles and follow along, because we're we're not going to quite do verse by verse, but it's going to be pretty close. So it's on page 1070 of uh, of your pew Bibles. So to start all this off, to give us some context, Mark chapter 6, verse 30 is right in the middle of Jesus' ministry. He has already begun to to get a great name for himself, especially in the region of Galilee. That is where he's from. That is where a majority of his ministry has taken place. Some took place in Jerusalem. Majority of his ministry was taking place in Galilee, the northern part of Israel. And he had healed the sick, he had healed the lame, he had driven out demons, he had preached a a gospel of of repentance that had power and force behind it. He taught as one who had authority, unlike the other teachers that had been there. And so his popularity was growing. And it wasn't just because of the ministry that he was doing and the places he was. His ministry was growing because he had also sent out his 12 disciples to go and preach the message of repentance and the gospel to the crowds and to the communities in the region of Galilee. In Mark chapter 6, verse 7, we read this a couple weeks ago, Jesus sent out the 12 disciples to go to different towns. And so his fame is spreading, and people are wanting to be with Jesus. That's an important thing for us to note as we get into our text today. But then we get into verse 30, and we read these words. The apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. So the, the apostles had been away. They had gone out to the, the, the towns that Jesus had sent them to. They had preached the gospel. They had preached the message of repentance. And now they were coming back to Jesus. Now they are returning from their first missionary journey. Up until that point, they had just been following Jesus and hearing Jesus. Now they were actively participating, joining, like I said a few weeks ago, they were joining Jesus on the mission that he was doing. Up until this point, they were just learning. Now they're actually actively joining and they return. Now what happens if a long journey that you've been sent out on with someone, a lot of times when you come back, you want to have a moment to connect with them to debrief, to share their excitement, to teach them maybe some more as well, to give them rest after a long time away. And that's what Jesus desires to do. In verse 31, he says to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Jesus cared about his disciples. He loved his disciples. And so he wanted to leave the crowds, not because he did not like the crowds, but he wanted to leave the crowds because he cared about his disciples. He wanted to connect with them. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to rejoice with them. He wanted to teach them, all those things I've already said. So he wants to be away with his disciples. But the crowds are so thick because of his popularity that he doesn't even have time to eat. Constantly there are people around him. And I don't think it's just that he doesn't have time. It's also, it's a mixture of that and the reality that he doesn't even have the space to eat. They are constantly crowding around him. And so Jesus wants to be alone with his disciples. And he goes with them to a desolate place. I think this is a pretty amazing thing as well. This this shows us a reminder, at least, of the nature of God as well. If we look back at creation, God created the world in seven days. 
Six days he worked, the seventh day he rested. He has sent his disciples out to work, and now it's not, not just about teaching them, but there's also an element where he wants them to come back and to rest as well, to rest in him and to be rejuvenated in him. So the solution to this is to get onto this boat, go on the Sea of Galilee, and that's what they do. They went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, desolate does not mean that it was a desert. It just means that it's removed from other communities. So this is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. And what you notice about the Sea of Galilee, even from this picture, you can get an idea of, it is a very, very large lake. It's not an actual sea. And also, most of that lake is like that. It's in a valley, so most of the the shoreline, you are above the water. And this is important for why the crowds are able to see where Jesus is going. It is a large lake, but it's it's not that much larger than Lake Minnetonka. So that's a big lake, but it's not enormous. And it's a round lake with nothing in between. And you're an elevated place to watch the sea. And so they go on this boat to go to the other side, to a desolate place. But many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And so this is, this is why the people are able to see where he's going. They see him get in the boat, and they see where the boat is going, and the crowds want to be with Jesus. After all, he's feeding, he's teaching, he's healing, he's changing lives. Of course they want to be with Jesus. And so the crowds all go and follow him. Now, the town he left from, uh, down here on the uh, uh, Bethsaida, up here, Bethsaida, where he left from, he ends up going to the Gennesaret Valley. That's at least where they believe this took place. We don't know that for certain. That's where we believe it took place. But he goes through here, and as he's walking by the people in Bethsaida, see where he's going. They see he's going this direction, and so they keep an eye on the boat, and they begin to walk. But... There's already a huge crowd there. As they go along, they come to Capernaum. And guess what? More people join them when they come to Capernaum. Then they come to Bethsaida of Galilee. And guess what? More people join them. And every single little village they go to, more and more and more and more people join them. So much so that by the time they actually get to their destination, there are 5,000 men, not including women and children. So in reality, there's somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people who have made that long journey by land all the way around to where Jesus is going on the boat. After all, it makes sense, right? This man is transforming everything. Of course you're going to go and try to be with him. I mean, I, I, try to think of like, I was trying to think of something that we can kind of get a, a modern day equivalent to, the kind of phenomenon that Jesus was. And I can't think of anything in the world today that draws people in unity around one person or one thing. The closest thing I could think of was back to the 60s which I was not around for, but I know some of you in this room were. With the Beatles, right? When the Beatles came to town, everyone showed up because it was, the, it was, it was, it was a world-changing band. People came from everywhere, and they, they, in some cases, almost worshipped them, right? Now imagine if the Beatles didn't just make good music, but they actually healed people. Do you think even more people would have showed up? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's Jesus. He is that power just from his teaching. The people want to be with him, but you throw in the fact that he's healing people and changing lives, and everyone is willing to drop everything to go and be in his presence. And so, as he goes by boat, the crowds go by land, and they see where he's going. And as they go, more and more and more people join that that huge gathering to go and meet him where he lands. And in verse 34, we read this. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was constantly surrounded by people all the time, I'd sent out my best friends on a mission, they had come back, and I wanted to spend some time with them, and I had intentionally gotten in a boat to get, especially after how much I've told you I'm afraid of water, intentionally gotten into a boat to get away from those crowds. 
And I got back to the other side and landed, and there was more people there than had been there before, I would not be a happy person. I would not be happy at all. As a matter of fact, I'd probably get back in the boat and just go, <laughs> just go back on the water, even though with how much I hate the boat. But you notice how Jesus responds here. Jesus looks on them with compassion. The Greek word is spongolizo. It's, it's a movement of the gut. His gut was moved. To his very core, he had compassion on them. Now, obviously, that makes sense. He's God, right? But he's also fully man. And in his humanity, he's moved. That, he has that compassion on those people. And the reason why he has that compassion is because they are sheep without a shepherd. Now, I'm not an expert on sheep, but I do, through my study of Scripture, I have learned a few things about sheep since Jesus likes to use that illustration of sheep so much. And some of the few things I've learned about sheep are this. They are defenseless, hopeless, weak, and in many respects, and this is going to sound harsh, but it's true, in many respects, useless creatures on their own. Without a shepherd, they, they, they literally have no defense at all. If a sheep is not protected by the shepherd, the natural predators, it's not a question of if they will get the sheep, it's a question of when they'll get the sheep. Also, sheep are not very intelligent. If the shepherd doesn't lead them to a new grazing ground, the sheep will be, if they find it, they'll just stumble into it out of pure dumb luck. And another thing is, well, this is just kind of a side note, but in my study of the Psalm 23, when you know Jesus is the great shepherd Psalm, and he's talking about the idea of, uh, you know, lead me, lead me beside still waters. That's actually very significant when it's using the comparison of sheep, because if sheep fall over in water, they cannot. This is actually true. They cannot get back up, and they will drown. That is how useless sheep are on their own. The shepherd has to be there to pick them up or they will drown. And that's why it's important to go by still waters in Psalm 23. But that's what Jesus sees when he sees these people. They're broken. They are hurting. They are beaten down with their sin. They are beaten down in their poverty. They are beaten down in their oppression as they are, they are being oppressed by Rome. They are beaten down just by the cares of life. And they have no defenses. And they're not being fed. And Jesus looks on them and sees them like sheep. And he loves them. And he acts as their shepherd. Now, we don't know what exactly he taught them, even though, I mean, I, I think we have a pretty good guess as to the content from the rest of Scripture. We can get an idea of what Jesus was teaching them. But regardless of what it was he said at this particular moment in time, he cared for them, he loved them, and he taught them. And he acted as their shepherd because they were wandering sheep. But then we get to the the big climax of the story. It's late at night now, late in the evening. The crowds have been out there for a long time. It's a desolate place. Likely it's about three and a half to four miles away from the nearest town that we know of where they believe this event happened. This is not an easy journey. It's rough ground. Three and a half to four miles would probably take an hour and a half to two hours. It's already late at night. And there is nothing around. No food. There's not a Burger King. It's not a McDonald's. There's not a food truck coming through. There's nothing. And the disciples deal with the reality of what they know in this moment. After Jesus has been teaching them, in verse 35 you read, And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. And their hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now it's easy for us, and this happens a lot when we read about the disciples, to say, why didn't you get it? How could you be so dense? Don't you know who you're with? 
But the reality is the disciples, we'd be the same way they were. And they're actually being very compassionate here. They're, they're not angry at the crowds. They're looking and saying, it's late. There's no food. Look at all these people. There's some old people. There's some young people. There's some people who probably haven't eaten all day. And, and it may actually, some of them may not make it back without food. So let's make sure they get back to the villages to buy food. It's interesting, this many men and women, a small, couple small villages would not have enough food for them anyway. So they're kind of, regardless, they're not going to, they're, they're going to be in a hard place anyway. But they're dealing with their reality of what they know. It's late, people are hungry, there's no food. What's the solution? Send them back home because maybe they can find some food there. It's amazing to me, though, how Jesus responds. You give them something to eat. I love that passage. Because here Jesus, Jesus knows what he's going to do. He knows he's going to provide for these people. But here in this moment, and this goes along with the theme of what I've been talking about the last few weeks and with the book that we're reading as well, this is Jesus inviting his disciples to join him in his work. You give them something to eat. I can do it, but I want you to participate in this ministry. You give them something to eat. And the disciples' response is, shall we go and buy 200 denarii and worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Their response is dealing once again with the reality of what they know. 200 denarii is 200 days wages. So essentially, it's working for seven to eight months. They don't have that kind of money, and once again, if they do, there's not enough food in the area anyway. So they once again are dealing in their reality, but what they don't realize at this moment is that the reality of their world and of our world is subordinate to the reality of God. God is able to make reality. And so they don't understand what Jesus is about to do. He's about to change the concept of what they think is possible. And he's going to use them in that as well. And so Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Now this is, uh, we know in, from the Gospel of Luke that they found this from a little boy who had five loaves of bread and two fish. But that's all they have. And it's important for us to note here as well, this is not five loaves of Wonder Bread, okay? Where you can feed, you know, at least a dozen people with five loaves of Wonder Bread. And these aren't like two 50-pound halibuts or salmon or something like that where you can feed a ton of people with a big... This is five little pita breads that would fit in your hand and two little fish. This is literally one little boy's lunch. I know that's what we read, but sometimes when we read five loaves, two fish, we think, well, this kid was carrying a lot of food. No, he wasn't. This is a food, this is a normal meal for a 12-year-old boy at that time. That's all there is. But this is amazing, because at this moment, we're going to see one of the clearest points in Scripture where the divinity of Jesus shines forth. He is fully man, and yet he is fully God. And here he shows that. He takes those five loaves of bread and two fish, and he separates the crowds. Uh, we read in verse 39, he commanded them all to sit down in groups in the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking those five loaves and those two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to be set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. This, like I said, is the mo Jesus shows his divinity here because he creates out of nothing. And I know you're saying, well, there's not nothing. There's five loaves of bread and two fish. How do you feed 15,000 people with one meal? He creates out of nothing, and only God can do that. And we look back and we see that the one who created the wheat to begin with, to make that bread, is the one who speaks and blesses and gives to all the people more than they could want. 
The one who created, spoke fish into existence is the one who separates that fish and creates more out of nothing to give to the people so that they are fully fed. He shows forth his divinity here beyond a shadow of a doubt. He is fully God, fully man. And he provides for the people who are there in that place with their physical needs in this moment. Even though we also know earlier he was meeting their spiritual needs, now he is also meeting their physical needs. But the other thing that's great in here is that who actually feeds the people? It's not Jesus. Now, Jesus, actually, Jesus is the one who provides. Jesus is the one who supplies. Ultimately, you can say, yes, Jesus is the one who feeds them. But the people who actually take the active part of distributing the food, Jesus does not do that. It's his 12 disciples. Earlier, he had said, you feed them. He doesn't change that request now. He still says, you feed them. I'll provide everything you need. All do the hard work, you just feed them. And they're the ones who do that. I don't know about you, but I mean, to me, I, I read through this so often, and we always just talk about how Jesus, this is really significant here, that Jesus uses the disciples to be the ones to distribute the food, especially after he had told them, you feed them. And I think that speaks very much to, to us, the church as well, which we'll get to in a moment. But right now we're just going to finish up. We're going to finish up the text and we'll get into kind of how this applies to us today. So they feed him. Everyone is satisfied. And then they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So I, this is significant as well in the fact that there is leftover food. 12 baskets full of food. And this is... Uh, the baskets would not be like a huge basket like you see in some of the paintings. But they'd be like a little, almost like a fanny pack kind of thing. It's a basket that you put on your hip and you carry it with you and you'd have your lunch in there. But there's leftovers for 12 people. That's, that's God, God, it's a sign there, it's a, it's a, a descriptor again there. That God doesn't just provide the needs of people, he provides abundantly. So this is a really great passage. And like I said, we read through this or we hear the story. We don't dig into it very much today. So I'm hoping that we've, as we've done that, you've maybe learned a few new things that you haven't learned before. But I don't want you just knowing interesting facts about this story. I think this story very much speaks to us today in our faith life as well. And there are probably more than three things we can learn from this story. But there's three things I want to focus on today. And there, that are these things. The first is that Jesus wants us to rest in him. I know we talked all about every aspect of this story, but if we go back to the very beginning of those first few verses, the entire story starts off with Jesus wanting to take his disciples away so they can rest in him and with him, so they can spend time together, he could teach them, and he can rejoice with them. The crowds all come to Jesus because that's what he's doing. He's wanting to be alone with his disciples and he's wanting them to find rest in him. And that is true for us today as well. We need to find rest in a weary, in a weary world. But rest does not just mean a good night's sleep or going up to the cabin on the weekend, even though there's nothing wrong with any of those things. The rest that we really need as the children of God is here. When we come to worship on Sunday, there are many reasons why we come to worship. But one of the most important reasons we come to worship is to find rest in Jesus. To be reminded that we are forgiven for our sins. To be fed by him in his word. To be fed by him in communion. We are to find rest here because when we go out into the world during the week, just like those people, those sheep who were shepherdless, we can get beat up. At our work, in our relationships, in our struggles in faith, and the things that happen in life that just, we, we can get beat up by life. And when we come to worship, we find rest in Jesus. We rejoice with Jesus. We learn from Jesus. 
And so worship is so important for us to participate in because we find rest in him. Which is a very important thing. The first command God gave was to rest. Right? Actually, the first command he gave was to work, actually. But, but that's another story. So, but we are to rest. The second thing, and this is not so much something that we learn today, but we are reminded of today, is that he has made us his sheep. We all, at one point in our life, were like sheep without a shepherd. Every single one of us, at some point in our life, were wandering hopeless, helpless, defenseless. And Jesus came and became our shepherd. He became our shepherd when he took on our humanity. And yes, even while he was fully God, he became fully human. He became our shepherd when he bore our sins on the cross. He became our shepherd as he suffered and died, as he rose from the grave. He became our shepherd as he called us into our new life in him through the waters of holy baptism. We are sheep of Jesus who have been bought with a price. But we need to remember today that we have the shepherd. That he is on our side and he'll be with us no matter what we go through. And finally, the last thing that I think really applies to us today is this. Jesus feeds us. He makes us his shepherds. I mean, he makes us his sheep. And then he asks us to feed others. I've been talking about this a lot lately, but I think it's, it's such an important thing for us as a church. We are to join Jesus in the work that he is doing. Not for salvation's sake, because this will not earn us salvation. But we are to do this because we are his sheep. And he invites us to go with him, just as he told the disciples, you go feed them. In the same way, he says to us, look at the people out there in our community. Look at the people in your, in, at your places of work, in your relationships. Those people, not all of them, but a lot of them, are sheep without shepherds. And I want you to bring me to them. I want you to feed them. He is the one who provides in all this. He's the one who creates faith. He's the one who's doing the work. But he wants us to go with him. In the same way that he was the one who actually provided the food, he did the really hard work, he still sent the 12 disciples to actually distribute it. In the same way he creates faith, he does the work, but he sends us to go with him in sharing the salvation, the hope that we have. And so this week, my prayer for you and for us as a church is that as we look at this passage and see all the very interesting things that are in here, that we would also look and see these three things and how they apply to us that all of you would find rest in Jesus. And if you're not able to be here because you're up at the lake or the cabin during the summer, find a church near where you're at and go on Sunday morning. Find rest in him. Be reminded that you are his sheep. And then as his sheep, feed those who are wandering without a shepherd. Amen. And now may that God of grace and mercy who feeds us and watches over us be with you and abide with you always. Amen.